Hey, what is up, mortals? It is Ellen here with a new video for you. Welcome to the fourth part of What If Deku Had the Rinnegan. Welcome back to Season 2. I just wanted to greet you guys by saying, sit back and relax. You're in for a treat. So, we begin. There was a wide chasm present in the obstacle course. And they didn't just mean the next portion of it. No, the chasm everyone could see was a metaphorical one, though no less obvious. It was a chasm that allowed some of them to struggle through climbing ropes and the others to fall for the very first robots. A chasm that allowed some to flourish and others to fall by the wayside. The chasm of power. And those three were at the helm of it. While almost everyone else struggled to navigate the mess of ropes and standing pillars that was the next great obstacle, three students breezed right through it. Midoriya Izuku, Katsuki Bakugo, and Todoroki Shoto. Those three. Midoriya went back to using his Asura path cannons when the chasm became visible, while Todoroki used his ice to create easy ways for himself to travel, and Bakugo continued to try and become a human missile. They had all surpassed each other dozens of times. At this point, they were shoulder to shoulder. Well, almost. Because Midoriya just seemed to take the lead more often than not. Well, damn! Mike cried out. Looks like the fall wasn't an obstacle at all to the leading three! That's only logical. Out of the three of them, Bakugo and Midoriya are essentially flying, and Todoroki has almost perfect control over the ground level. A chasm was never going to slow them down. Mike snickered. Maybe. This next one is bound to be more trouble, though. The last obstacle in this course, the minefield! It's set up so that you can actually see the minds if you're careful. You're going to have to work both your eyes and your feet to win here. Two of them. Aizawa repeated, since clearly he'd not been clear enough. Are flying. Oh, right! But Todoroki is the one in the lead for now, and he's barely using any tricks! While his ice can speed him up, he's effortlessly tracking each of the mines in instants! That kid's a genius! The three continued to run. Truth is, the exams were rigged to be disadvantageous to the kids in the front. Helps with the entertainment factor. But Todoroki wasn't bothered by it. Using the ice's low friction to speed himself up, Endeavor Sun was able to maintain a constant speed that neither Midoriya or Bakugo could. Their methods were clever, but they had their costs, mainly in stamina. They had to repeatedly burst themselves forward in order for their methods to work, while Todoroki had demonstrated that this level of control over ice was nothing to him. At this rate, he would win. Not an inch behind him, Bakugo, who had more experience with propelling himself, had overtaken Midoriya again and was now clawing at victory with tooth and nail. As for the green-haired boy who had stolen the spotlight with his bold words, it was clear he had a plan. Midoriya twisted in the air like a gymnast, pointing hands and feet behind himself and his back to the finish line of the course. What was he even planning? A singular burst wouldn't help that much. The boy loaded his attack and angled it downwards, shooting himself up as well as to the front. The explosion of blue light that emanated was amazingly powerful, scorching the ground beneath him and completely shattering part of the rocks behind, but it wouldn't be enough. His advantage was momentaneous, and he was far too high up now. The fall would be ugly. Midoriya spiraled through the air, once again letting his weapon fade back into his flesh as Bakugo tried to shoot himself forward faster than Todoroki could dash and skid. With the ice spikes the Son of Endeavor left in his wake, though, it became difficult for the blonde to gain speed. He had to constantly dodge obstacles his opponents created, stopping him from accumulating momentum. This balance was what kept the three leading names in something of a standstill. Meanwhile, Midoriya continued to twirl far above the heads of his fellow competitors, extending hands towards Bakugo and Todoroki from behind and above. Exertion was clear in his face even through the televised images, beads of sweat dripping down his skin and his eyebrows furrowed in profound concentration. Five, Izuku mouthed. Aizawa's eyes narrowed. What was he? Oh. Despite himself, he felt himself grinning at the realization. Midori is about to do something clever. Like what? The power from earlier that he used to destroy the robots wasn't just force, it was repulsion. What Midoriya does isn't just push, though. If he can push... Izuku continued to spiral, and then he stabilized himself, flaring his eyes dangerously as his fingers tensed. It had been far more than five seconds, after all. Punch Shotenin! The boy screamed. Both Bakugo and Todoroki had been running wildly ahead, and the two were suddenly stopped, dragged back as if pulled by the shirts. Meanwhile, Midoriya Izuku was flung forward by his own momentum. Two competitors were pulled backwards, one continued to burst forward. 
The result was obvious. Todoroki managed to stop his movement backwards by erecting a pillar of ice to dig his heels into, while Bakugo literally sunk his fingers into the ground out of sheer determination. Midoriya hadn't put that much force into the pole, clearly. They'd each lost three seconds at most. It was more than enough. He can pull. For Midoriya, Izuku continued his reckless path forward and passed the finish line. Amidst the chaos of those who finished right after, two people stood out to Izuku's eyes. The first was Bakugo, who was staring at his own trembling hands with wide eyes and gritted teeth. Crimson orbs refused to leave his own palms, as if they'd reveal the truth behind his loss. Again? God damn it! He wasn't taking it too well. But that was alright, because Izuku himself wasn't really taking it too well either. He'd landed ungracefully on his shoulder, and he had heard rather than felt the moment his shoulder had been dislocated by the fall. Thankfully, it was just a matter of setting it back into place. Not. It would hurt like nothing else to do so, and he was absolutely spent. Switching between the Asura and Diva paths whilst using both to this extent was an exhaustive task of a kind he'd not gone through before. And what made it all the more bitter was that he knew for a fact that either would have been more than enough to win him the match if he'd mastered them. Still, he'd won. Through the same sort of trickery both of his opponents had been employing, but he'd won. It felt weird. Hey! The second person that had drawn his eyes screamed, sprinting towards him. He met eyes with Uraraka for the first time since the race started and flashed her a smile, though he suspected his reluctance was clear. It hurt. You did amazing! Uh, uh, I... Uraraka's face turned sour. Dimly, Izuku noted that Ida had chosen not to approach them, hanging back with a pensive look on his face. He did flash Izuku a smile from afar, but it was brief. Seemed like he wasn't the only one with complicated feelings. Izuku clutched at his limp arm. I'm really happy for you, Uraraka continued, eyebrows furrowed. But damn, I wanted to win! Ah, he thought, there she was. The more time he spent with the girl, the more Izuku realized that Uraraka had a competitive streak a mile long. Struggling to get to his feet, he tried to reassure her. Uh, I think you did great! Twelfth place is nothing to scoff at, especially since your quirk isn't too suited to this sort of task. She paused. I guess... But plus, you're in! So, you can increase your standing in whatever the next task is? That seemed to fire her up. She nodded animatedly, eyes bursting with intensity. Yeah, yeah, you're right! I can just kick ass now that I'm here! Then the girl narrowed her eyes. Hey, what's wrong with your arm? Ah, I... He's dislocated it, someone else cut in. It was the familiar voice of Yayorozu Momo. She looked quite disappointed in herself, her eyes downcast and her posture stiff. With his perfect eyesight, Izuku noticed that she had faint bags under her eyes that not even makeup could perfectly hide. Was she not sleeping well? Still, as the tall girl looked at them, her expression was both hesitant and stern. I saw your fall, the girl spoke. You should probably get it checked out. I don't think I have the time, he commented, seeing Midnight approach the remaining students from her spot as judge. In a few moments, she'd explain the second task. I'll have to force it back on my own. He and Uraraka watched as Yayorozu paused, grimaced, and shook her head. Without as much as a word, she walked to the spot right behind Izuku and put a hand on his shoulder, grabbing his arm with her remaining one. I don't think you'll know how, so... Allow me. It'll hurt, though. I'll do it on three, all right? Uh, Okay. She put some pressure on his shoulder, readying her grip, and Izuku did his best to relax his muscles. If he resisted it, even unconsciously, he'd make things a lot worse. Best to get it over with. One. It was surprising that she'd know how to, though. Then again, Yayorozu always seemed to be well-informed. Perhaps she'd taken first aid classes as a child? Two. But she didn't wait for a three, snapping his shoulder back into position with a sudden yank and push that sent a brilliant flare of agony through his shoulder. Determined not to make as much as a noise, Izuku gritted his teeth and let out a gasp. (gasps) It hurt. It really, really hurt. Then it was over. Momo let go of his shoulder, and Uraraka stepped forward to see if he was okay. He was fine, though. Izuku flashed his friend a thankful smile and then turned to offer his thanks to Momo as well, but the girl was now looking ahead. For a moment, their eyes met, and he felt a sharp pang of... something... in his gut as his eyes played a trick on him. In an instant, though, it had faded and she was looking ahead yet again. He followed her gaze. Midnight had taken a spot on the podium and now prepared to address the passing students. 
Unlike himself, the pro hero thrived and bloomed under the cameras. Her brilliant grin was clear for the world to see, her costume accentuating her movements in all the right ways. It wasn't just about being sexy for Midnight. The woman demanded attention. Hey there, everyone. She spoke, silencing everyone. First of all, I'm happy to announce that everyone who made it into the top 42 is advancing into the next stage. For all of you who didn't make the cut, don't feel too bad. It's all a learning experience. Ah, uh, but let's cut to the chase, the second event. I already know what it is, but the suspense is still killing me. So I'll tell you all, too. Behold! She snapped her fingers, and a widescreen behind her suddenly lit up. Within it, clear words could be seen. Human cavalry battle. Still, as everyone watched Midnight explain the rules for the next part, Izuku found his mind wandering to Yayorozu yet again. He wasn't too close to the girl, but he'd seen her at work a good few times and had seen her speak enough to have a decent grasp on her personality. So something about her felt... strange. Plus, for a moment there... No, it was nothing. Well... For a moment there, Izuku could have sworn her eyes had been red. Turns out, winning meant Izuku's headband was worth a whole 10 million points. He really should have settled for second place. It would still be almost enough to pass by doing nothing. Instead, he was forced to stand there with his eyes wide open as everyone else almost instantly flocked together into teams. No one seemed to want to team with him, and why would they? Everyone would be gunning for his head. Well, he resolved, whatever. Honestly, his situation didn't matter all that much. He still had the chance to be with the people he wanted to be with. Because at the core of it all, Izuku Midoriya was a remarkably simple person sometimes. His strategies were ingenious. In fact, he had no doubt that, if he wanted to, he could work out a near-perfect plan by recruiting some people he'd seen in his class. But that wasn't what he wanted. Right then and there, Izuku wanted only two people in his corner, and those were the two people he could comfortably call his friends at UA. Ida and Uvaraka. Thankfully, Uvaraka accepted his offer almost immediately, which may or may not have made him cry a bit, but... Ida, well... I am thankful, but I refuse. I will not be in your shadow forever, Midoriya. As your friend, I wish to do nothing but help you, but I am also here as a rival. I had always planned to face you when the sports festival came up, to take you on as an equal. However, the USJ gave me yet another reason. I do not wish to feel powerless to help ever again. If I only ever follow in your footsteps, I will never challenge myself. So I resolve here to face you, and to do my best to beat you. Let us go above and beyond. So, as it turns out, everyone was the enemy. Well, kind of. On the bright side, he'd been approached by someone else instead, a girl by the name of Hatsumi Mei from the support department. She was amazingly intelligent, but Izuku was able to deduce almost immediately that she was really only in it for the promotion. Not that he minded. With Uraraka and Mei at his side, Izuku had quickly come up with a strategy of his own and headed off to recruit the missing piece. However, Tokoyami Fumikage was not someone he'd talked with much. The bird-like boy was aloof at the best of times and unapproachable at worst. His quirk, Dark Shadow, had always fascinated Izuku, but not enough to defeat his social anxiety. Still, from the remaining students, Fumikage would have been perfect to execute the plan he'd had in mind. However... I refuse, the boy muttered. Though I would like to help you, this revelry is not one I fear I can take. Our paths are not meant to join here. That's what he said. What Izuku heard, however, was that Fumikage wasn't sure he wanted to work with Izuku after the USJ. The boy wasn't one of the few who'd openly judged him, but clearly wasn't exactly stoked about him either. That doused his enthusiasm a bit. As Tokoyami walked away, Izuku chewed on his lips in thought, trying to fight all sorts of ugly feelings. It wasn't easy. It really wasn't easy. He soon tried to team up with Ashiro Mina and Sero Hanta, who'd been eyeing teams of their own but hadn't been recruited yet. They'd given him similar answers, however, citing his high price value headband as a reason. He knew they were lying, though, because not once did either have the courage to meet his eyes. He tightened his hands into fists so tightly it hurt. Wow, they really weren't kidding when they told me you were a touchy subject in your class, huh? His head whipped to May so fast it hurt. What? Oh yeah, I don't really listen to people all that much. It would be less time spent on my babies, but people do talk. Word on the school is you killed someone at the USJ and the school was trying to cover it up. Pretty nasty. Not that I care. Oh. Dread piled up in his guts at that. 
It was Uraraka who broke him out of his funk a few seconds later. Don't feel too down, okay? But, uh, I think we have to hurry. We're running out of time. R right, he frowned. Let's see, who else isn't in a team already? Well, May commented, there's always the black-haired girl you talked with earlier. Yayurozu? She has a team. I saw her talking to Todoroki and Ida. Yes, Yayurozu herself admitted, making Izuku jump a bit. He'd been a bit too distracted. However, I refused their offer. I would very much like to join your team if you'd have me. Sure! Ochaku cheered, not even giving Izuku the chance to respond. She looked relieved her competitive spirit would probably demand nothing less, and Yayurozu was a good fit for them. We'd love to have you, right? Uh... Of course! Your ability should prove most useful! Is that not right, Ten Million? Yeah? He didn't really feel like he'd been given a choice anyway. The cavalry battle was a game of strategies. The first objective everyone would share were the ten million points. The single target would draw the entire field's attention, but it would also guarantee you a first place spot if you got it. Because of that, Izuku had instantly known he had to play defensive. He was his team's rider, with Uraraka at the front of the horse while Hatsume and Yayurozu were at the back. Honestly, it was a weird team build with a weirder strategy, but he felt a bit confident. If everything worked, their worst enemy would be Mei's ceaseless attempts to convince Yayurozu to work for her for free. Team Midoriya had 10,325 points. By comparison, Team Bakugo and Team Todoroki both had about 650, with Bakugo's team having the slight edge. Because each team had more than one banner, they were usually relatively safe even if they lost one of them. But the 10 million was the one thing keeping Team Midoriya afloat. Sometimes literally. Start! Uraraka, Hatsume, now! Got it! Step one of the plan was remarkably simple. Uraraka would make them weightless, Hatsume's jetpack would make them float. As soon as the match started, Izuku gave the order for the combo they'd arranged to be initiated, and the entirety of Team Midoriya soared above the heads of everybody else. It was clear to both Momo and Izuku that they would be rushed almost immediately by a lot of teams. Step one was an evasion, but also a way to make teams stop paying attention to them by driving many teams that had intended to attack them into one another. As skirmishes began, Midoriya was able to realize that it had worked, if only so much. But... Dodge! The backpack fired to the side, and they barely sidestepped Asui Suyu's tongue from down below, where she'd taken refuge within Shoji's... back. Was that even allowed? Whatever. Uvaraka had to release the float effect, and the team found itself rapidly descending, though their fall wasn't all too bad. Still, there was the next issue. Feeling real good about yourself, aren't you, you asshole? Die! A screaming Bakugo that was flying at them at breakneck speed, connected to his horse only by Sero's tape. Such a versatile quirk! The blonde's hand was lunging at the ten million points headband, fingers extended and lips curled into a nasty grin. Izuku instantly saw through him. He expected Izuku to repel him with the diva path. Had Bakugo already worked out Izuku's limitations regarding the five seconds between techniques? Probably. The blonde could be wicked smart when he felt like it. If Izuku did, Sero would likely use his other arm to tape the headband and pull it in. Clever. But not clever enough. Uraraka! Yeah! The thing is that Uraraka's position at the front wasn't just so she could have better access to Deku and use her quirk on everyone more effectively. The girl had explicitly requested to be there, and this was why. She really liked being in fights. The rocket boots Hatsume gave them activated, giving Uraraka's leg an oomph. An oomph it needed to violently kick at Uraraka's head level and at Bakugo's chin from below with enough force to whip his head back, a trail of blood escaping from his lips as it did. Izuku practically heard the crunch. Ouch! Present Mike winced at his booth. That was brutal! Bakugo was forced back and Team Midoriya fell, bending their knees to absorb the kinetic damage. As Momo finished creating a certain item, they regained their footing and Izuku prepared to initiate Phase 3, as soon as they fended off anyone too close to them. The four of them took a moment to cheer. Even Yayorozu, who'd looked a bit forlorn thus far, managed a bright smile of her own. After building this much distance, Izuku called on his Rinnegan to prepare the diva path and took note of every team he could see fighting. And then he winced, because Todoroki's team was heading right towards them. Sorry, but we're taking it, the cold boy announced clearly. Your time is up. Thank you all for sticking around, and I hope that you enjoyed. 
Before you leave, we would just like to let you know that We the Celestials has many other channels for your entertainment and viewing purposes. All the information you'll need is right below here in the description, so feel free to check out all the other incredible projects our team creates. Secondly, on behalf of We the Celestials, I'd like to thank everyone involved in the production of today's awesome content. Their details will be in the description below. That's all for today's video, so goodbye and have a divine day.